Okay, so all right. So uh, our previous topic, which we have just finished, but we will quickly recap here. Okay, players in financial markets, different types of players. We've classified three types of players: arbitrageurs, hedgers, speculators. High-level classification is three categories. Then we have two subcategories within uh, speculators. We have directional speculators, and we have market makers. So the implication of this kind of a subclassification within speculators is obviously that uh, the um, market makers are not directional speculators okay have you understood what the reason for that is we'll quickly run through that once again okay we can take a different example here with a different type of chart okay so now here for instance uh, in the euro let's say this is a chart of the all our euro charts actually these are different time frames okay so the the market that's being covered is the euro usd spot market the same thing that's here you can see the price 112.38 which is the same as the price you see here, which is again 112.37.8 here. Let's try and see if we can configure something here. So you can see the euro. Uh, you can see the euro prices here as well. The same price. Okay. So these are actually these are spot euro prices, spot foreign exchange prices. And so if I had a view, let's say, why is it why is this directional speculation? Just quickly recapping. Uh, so if I had a view, let's say, that at this point of time, if I have a view that the euro is actually going to go up, okay, uh, and I buy the euro. Okay, and so therefore what, what I need uh, in order to make a profit, what I need is, I need this to move up, right, obviously. So I need a big directional move in order to make a profit. So those who do this stuff, so you've already seen this, now I'm giving a special name to it. You're already familiar with this, all these people who are asset managers, that's exactly what they're doing. They are buying particular stocks because they think those stocks are going to go up. If they feel that certain stocks are going to go, go down, they might go short. Okay, or in India, of course, the ability to go short is quite limited because the market is not well developed for shorting. But in theory, you could go short if you had a bearish view on a stock. Okay, so the implication, the reason I call these people, so the typical example of a directional speculator is a asset manager. Okay, typical asset managers, traditional asset managers that you're aware of, mutual fund managers. These are all directional speculators. Anybody trading for their personal account typically is also a directional speculator. Okay, because they need a big directional move to make money. All right, so we are distinguishing that from market makers. I think the font is pretty big now for everyone to see, right? So if we want to make sure that we see the ask price also properly. I don't need this actually here. All right, what happened? Something happened there. I must have knocked it out. So okay, it's gone to the top. All right. So you can see the uh, foreign exchange prices, which are live right now. Okay. You could also see NSE prices if you wanted to. We can also put in NSE prices if we put in TCS. Uh, here you get data consultancy services NSE. So you have to choose the right. Remember that this is actually a U.S. Uh, listed stock. So this has got the same kind of same ticker. So you have to be careful. So you have to choose uh, this one. This is coming back to the question that Mittal was asking the other day. How do I know that this is the uh, listed on uh, this is a U.S. stock or why is this listed on the NYC? When you see it, it asks you which uh, which particular stock do you want. Okay, so you can see the the market makers who are making prices. Okay, we can either look at this or we can look at a different example. Let's say on the euro, very very tight spreads on the euro. You can see almost no spread. So I want to see something where there's a fairly wide spread. Okay, so let's look at some of these. Uh, uh, US equities because I want to give you a good example 
here also the spread is not that good. So let me give you a better example by looking at stocks where the spread is quite wide. Amazon would be a good example because it's not trading right now. So the spread is quite wide. So you can see, everyone can see the spreads on Amazon. Yes. 17, uh, we'll just say 71, 94. We just call it 72 and 76. Is that okay? Yes, we'll round it off and say 71 and uh, 72 and 76. All right. So now if you want to sell, uh, these are the market makers prices. Okay. So if you want to, okay, before we get on to bids and offers, that's actually the next subtopic so the point about the direct distinction between uh, market the directional speculators and market makers okay why is that distinction being made the implication is that market makers are not directional speculators why because the market makers actually do not want a big directional move in the stock in the asset price okay because ideally the ideal situation for a market maker is okay so to some extent we have to understand bids and offers okay so go back and if you still focus on the Amazon uh, price to make it easier for you I'll try to insert one here and one here so that we can make it stand out okay so we look at the Amazon price and uh, so we have uh, 72 and 76 all right and so this is the market maker quoting 72 and 76 so if you have to sell if you want to sell Amazon at what price will you sell 72 yeah we are calling okay it is 71 now rounded is 71 now so let's call it 71 so we will sell at 71 is everyone clear about that yes. these are all basics so please make sure if your basics are not clear you'll have problems later on okay so make sure that your basics are uh, clear Simran I think you're you are not clear about this you have to pipe up on your own right I have to like scan the class and see the expressions and find out from your expression that it doesn't look convincing so, I had a confusion about and price. so you have to ask me then no why now I have to uh, you know poke you and then only you'll pipe up you should pipe up on your own yes so what is the problem difference between ask and bid okay which is the bid and which is the ask do we know say Amazon now what is the bid we'll just talk about the last two digits 73 is the bid yes. is everyone clear about this this is the price at which the market maker is willing to buy is called the bid okay so the bid and offer is really from the market maker so the easy way to remember this is to say that uh, this is I mean you have to think of it from the market makers perspective so this is all basic stuff but you have to get your lingo and jargon correct the concept should be clear once you master this then you can just move on and you don't have to uh, visit this again okay so the bid at the price at which the market maker is willing to buy is called the bid and the price at which he is willing to sell is called the offer we have this here as well we have already gone through it uh, trading on quotes okay so market makers we refer to as MMs okay so this is what we see the price at which MMs are willing to buy the base asset is the bid and the price at which they are willing to sell is called the offer so it's from the market makers perspective okay clear and so obviously the the market maker is the price maker and if you are the price taker any customer who's dealing with the market maker is the price taker okay or the cust uh, customer or the price taker so he has to deal on the market makers terms okay so therefore he will always get uh, the worst of the two prices okay so if he wants to sell he'll have to sell at the lower price if he wants to buy he'll have to buy at the higher price in other words to be more specific so the customer the price taker if the price taker wants to sell he will have to sell at the market makers bid or offer when the price taker wants to sell because he has to deal on the market makers too. so remember this this you have to be clear about this is where you have to clear up your it's not very complicated at all but you have to spend some time thinking about it this is where your revision comes in if you guys you are encountering these concepts for the first time they're not very complicated concepts but at the same time it's a new concept that you're encountering if you're not revising it if you're not going to revise at home then you will not be able to in a, you know master the concept if you do a little bit of revision once you master it that's it then you don't have, don't have to worry about it for the rest of your life but you have to spend that little bit of time revising with your own notes as I said go through the video each uh, uh, go into segments pause it watch what's written on the screen what is being said then write your own notes to and once you do that then you have completely mark you basically don't have to study for the end terms after that because uh, the, all I'm going to ask you is all the stuff from here and then be, there'll be some maybe there'll be some googlies which uh, tests your concepts and all that but most of the questions 
even if you can't get the Google, you can still at least get 85 to 90 percent of the paper correct, which is good enough. Okay, and that's all you will be tested on. So essentially, that that's you just have to make sure that your concepts are clear, where all the concepts are being taught, everything is clear, and you master it one and that once, and that's your and ends your preparation for the exam as well, and it gives you a good foundation of basic knowledge about how markets operate. All right, so it helps you to understand all kinds of markets. So bids and offers, is it very clear now? Market makers, all these concepts should be clear. Market makers, also called price makers, okay, MMs, price makers. Customers who are price takers, okay, we can write it here, okay. Yeah, so the customer who deals on the MMs prices is called a price taker. Price maker, price taker. Market maker, customer. So the customer must buy at the MMs offer and the customer must sell at the MM's bid. Clear? You have to deal on his terms. So this is where the other part comes in, that a market, see here the implicit idea of the uh, definition of a market has already come into the picture, which is a market is a venue for the exchange of assets, right? So if the customer is selling, and here we're talking about with reference, basically uh, uh, the implicit reference is to the base asset. So if the customer is selling the base asset, okay, because the prices are all for the base asset, one unit of the base asset. So if the customer is selling the base asset, then what is the customer buying? He's buying the terms asset, okay. And if the customer is selling the base asset, then the other side of this picture is, the customer is selling the base asset, so what is the market maker doing with the base asset? He is buying it, right? So this is how you have to work your logic, that each party is doing the opposite. So each party is doing the opposite with respect to the base asset and the terms asset. And each party is doing uh, with respect to once you freeze either base asset or terms asset, whatever one party is doing to that uh, base asset or terms asset, the other party is doing the opposite. So if one party is selling the base asset, that means the other guy has to be buying the terms a base asset. All right. So this is also, as I said, it's not complicated, but it's a little, uh, it's a new concept. So you just have to spend some time understanding all these, understanding it from all these uh, different angles. And once you do that, then you are very clear about the concepts, right? What is happening in a particular transaction, right? So you see here, we have not violated our uh, definition of a, mar a transaction in a financial market being a contract to exchange assets. So that's all that is happening. Customer is selling the base asset, therefore market maker must be buying the base asset. And market maker will buy the base asset at which price, bid or offer? At the bid price. At the bid price, right? So that's the definition of the bid price, is the price at which the market maker buys the base asset. Right? Is this clear? Okay. Alright. So this is what we have. So everyone is clear now that if you want to sell, if you want to sell Amazon, you will sell at 73 or 77? 77. Who said 77? Who said 77? Catch him. So I heard a male voice saying 77. Who was that? Yash. Yes. Who said? Somebody said 77. I heard a 77 from there. Anyway, doesn't matter, but you should be clear that if you are selling, you, you if you are selling, you should be selling at 73. Is that clear? If you are selling, you are selling at the bid price, at the market maker's bid. Okay? And we don't say market maker's bid. We just say bid and offer. It is understood that this is the market maker's bid and the market maker's offer. Okay? We look at prices in markets and we say bids and offers. Is that clear to everyone? When you are a customer or price taker, you are buying at the offer, selling at the bid. Yeah. Don't memorize it. Make sure you understand it logically because everything is logically connected. One party is giving one asset, taking the other asset. Okay, we have two questions. Tanya first. So, the price in the chart that uh, the price will be asked price. So, one minute. No, we'll come to that. That's not the ask price. That's actually just as you can define it either way. Okay, you can define, you can instruct the charting software what price you want plotted. But in general, if nothing is mentioned, what we are plotting is actually the mid price. Okay, so in, 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 in general what is plotted here, the mid price would be 73, 77, so the mid price would be 75. So in general charts or charting software will plot the mid price by default. But you can always instruct the charting software that I want you to plot the mid price, uh, the bid price or the offer price. Okay, so the chart that uh, normally is the, the default uh, value plotted is the mid price. 
okay this mid price is sometimes also called mid market so if you hear the expression mid market means it's the average of the bid and offer okay all right so this much everybody is clear now about okay that uh, this concept of two-way prices market makers what do the market makers do we are trying to understand still we actually went ahead a little bit it's necessary to do this uh, uh, journey forward to understand bids and offers and how it works uh, to understand the market making business we're trying to understand the market making business and we're trying to see why we are saying that market makers are not directional speculators they're also speculators okay so uh, but everything is everyone's clear about this operation now how the market works the market makers sit there making prices two-way prices two-way prices mean there's a bid and an offer both okay and then the customers come and deal on their prices okay so now what is the ideal situation from a from a market makers point of view okay if you look at uh, the uh, situation the, from a market makers point of view he doesn't really want this kind of movement that you see here say for instance here you see this dramatic fall in the price he doesn't really want this kind of thing because it could easily happen that remember that it's not going to be every situation in real life is not going to be ideal it's not that in uh, you know every uh, at every point of time or every hour if you look at the market makers book okay or his business you'll see that 50 percent of the customers have sold to him and 50 percent have bought from him life doesn't work like that it's not that regular okay every day there'll be some kind of imbalance or some of some sort okay so there may be people who are like for instance on the nyse there are designated market makers for each stock okay for groups of stocks you have designated market makers they are called specialists okay now these guys what they have them i'm taking the example of the nyse specialist because that's a good example of a designated market maker so these guys have a responsibility so general electric anybody wants to all the general electric orders that come sell orders buy orders for general electric common stock there's a designated market maker who has to fit, take care of that and he's probably taking care of a whole bunch of other stocks as well so now he has to quote now he has a book obviously suppose early in the morning he is running a square i mean square book means zero position okay then suddenly somebody comes and gives him uh, say uh, give the other expression that we use is that uh, we say gives when somebody hits the bid we say gives and uh, so we say at this point i'm going to note this down here a little bit more of jargon here which is i'm not writing proper english i'm going to write it should be on the bid but hit on bid I'm going to again structure it like this. Here, MM is market maker. So this again is uh, market lingo. Okay, so we're just making sure that you're aware of all these terms. Okay, so what are we trying to say here? We, we can see the bids and offers in any market. When we look at any market, we can see the bids and offers. You can see everything lined up here. You can see how tight the bids and offers are on the dollar yen. The liquid currency markets like the euro and the dollar. You see how tight it is? You, can, you, you have to go to the fifth decimal to see the difference. Okay, that's what is that that's what is meant by you know, that's what happens in a liquid market. The spreads are very tight. We're coming to that a little bit later. But so we have understood all this. We can see the prices. So when the customer trades on the on when the customer sells to the market maker, okay, we say that the market maker. So that means he's hitting the bid. Okay, so we say hitting the bid or hitting the offer, hitting the bid or uh, lifting the offer. Okay, so when the customer when the market makers hit on the bid, we say the market maker was given. So if a market maker is saying that I was given $10 million, that means somebody traded $10 million on my bid, which means I bought $10 million worth of the base asset. Is this clear? This is just market lingo. Given and taken, I think logically you'll remember it because if you are given something means now you have some units of that. Okay, so somebody gives me some chalk, that means I have some chalk with me. So somebody takes the chalk from me means I have less chalk on me, right? So given taken makes sense because if I'm selling something when when so when is hit on the when the market makers hit on the bid we say that he's given okay which makes sense because if he's being hit on the bid that means he's buying the base asset right so if he's buying the base asset that means the number of units of the base asset in his possession ha has increased because he just bought some 
Okay? Yes, Puneet, you are following? Okay, so that's why we say he was given. And if he's take if he's hit on the offer, of, okay, then we say he was taken. And which is the same has the same connotation, right? Somebody takes my chalk, that means now I have little less chalk with me. Is that clear? So taken means he has lost some of the base asset. So we say that the market maker was taken. Okay, so the market maker might, might say I was taken for uh, six million dollars or whatever. That means somebody bought six million dollars worth of the base asset from him. Is this clear? Given, taken. This is other jargon that you have to be clear. So, so we for essentially how the real uh, situation works. I mean, how it works in real life is that you're not going to have. Uh, a perfectly matched book so you have a let's say you look at a specialist on general electric stock on the nyse he will every morning when he starts with a uh, with a clean slate with a square position okay suddenly somebody comes and sells him six million shares of general electric okay so now he's long six million shares okay so then what might happen is he might find that throughout the day there's some kind of a selling uh, in, uh, pressure in the market so uh, there are not many people buying from him but people are continuously dumping stock on him they are continuously dumping general electric stock on him so by the afternoon he might find that he's long sub maybe 75 million shares or something like that okay so therefore uh, or maybe there is some in and out some kind of uh, uh, some people are buying some people are taking him on the offer okay some people are taking from him but net there is an imbalance okay so he has an imbalance so he's basically net long 75 million shares let's say at the end of the day he might or towards the close of the day he might find that he's net long this much share so there is likely to be in real life there's always likely to be an imbalance you're not going to have a perfectly match situation where every somebody whoever sells you i mean if some people are selling 50 million dollars worth of uh, shares to you that means they will also be buying 50 million dollars that's not how a market works okay in every market in real life there's going to be some kind of imbalance you don't know which way it will be and you don't know how what the sequence of trades will be you can't predict that but you most like you have to be prepared for the fact that there's not going to be a perfectly matched uh, you know book right so so therefore these guys what these now if suppose the guy has a very large net long position okay and after that what happens is let's say this if you assume this is a general electric stock and after this if you are situation like this here and then the market suddenly drops then you suffer a big loss right so these guys so essentially market makers because they always have some kind of imbalance in uh, in their books so maybe a huge imbalance or a small imbalance okay generally according to your limits you will try to if the moment the imbalance starts getting a little bit too big you will go and do a trade yourself in the market or you will adjust your prices in some way so that you quickly reduce your uh, the imbalance in your position okay so you might have a limit you might have a rule for yourself that if my total position goes to more than say 25 million each way either x 25 million net long or 25 million net short i will immediately cut it back down to say 15 million so i'll immediately go and trade for 10 million are you following so the market maker might have a rule that okay if i now he sees that uh, his net position has become uh, net long 25 million shares okay so he has this rule that uh, now you can set the limit at any point of time it depends on how much risk appetite you have okay but obviously can you see clearly that this is a speculative business this is not a hedging business because in the morning the general electric market maker starts with a square book okay ideally a market maker should ha behave like a day trader he should have no positions at the end of the day okay if you have positions at the end of the day, sometimes they do carry positions but that's not good practice it means basically that you have some position on which you're losing money and you don't want to take a loss so you are trying to keep it overnight and try your luck okay so that's not good practice a good market maker should basically go home square okay do your daily business and go home square okay that's what you should do so uh, ideally so once he has a so depending on the amount of so you can clearly see that this is a risky business can you see that because the general electric market maker comes in in the morning he has a square position then suddenly people come and start dumping stock on him so suddenly his long position keeps on net long position keeps on increasing plus 6 plus 11 plus 17 then maybe after that somebody comes and buys 5 from him so it goes from plus 17 to plus 12 are you following yes. so his position net long position is plus 17 then the next trade is somebody buys 5 million from him okay somebody takes him for 5 million so net position goes down to plus 12 
okay in this way it will keep on fluctuating up and down but eventually he may find at some point of time if there is excess selling pressure in the market he may find that he is getting net long because everybody is dumping stock so who are they going to dump on they're going to dump on the market maker okay so he might find that his position has become net long 25 and if he has an internal rule that 25 is his cutoff okay if you had more risk appetite your cutoff could be much bigger like 50 million 75 million so in this case let's assume that this guy's cutoff is 25 million so the moment he goes 25 million net long okay he will what he will do i'm just giving a simplistic example what he should do is he should immediately go and deal with another market maker i'm giving a simple example he should immediately go and deal with another market maker and buy back 25 uh, let's say the rule is that if it goes to 25 million i will immediately reduce it to 15 million i will reduce the net long to 15 million the moment the uh, the net long goes to 20 hits 25 million i will reduce my net long to 15 million are you following the rule sugar is not clear how will you reduce the net long now we are coming to that but the rule is clear it's like I'm a bank, I'm telling you if your cash balance drops below 50,000 rupees, you have to immediately top it up to 500,000 rupees. Same kind of rule, the other way around. I'm saying if your net position goes to 25, if it goes to 25 million, if your net position goes to 25 million, you have to immediately bring it down to 15 million. Okay, now how we'll do this, we can see easily. So if he has to bring from plus 25 down to plus 15, what transaction does he have to do? He has to sell. He has to sell. He has to sell 10. Okay, so from plus 25, if he can sell 10, he will come back to plus 15, which is what his risk management rule requires. So it's clear. This is an example of a risk management rule where you try to manage your position size and make sure that it doesn't get too big. Here, too big is, is defined as 25 million for this particular guy. Now, some other guy who has lots of risk capital can have a much bigger uh, definition of too big. His definition of too big could be 75 million. Okay, so this varies from uh, entity to entity. So now he has to sell 10. So he's going to deal with, let's take a simplistic example, uh, assumption where he is going to deal. So if he has to deal, now he has to deal with other market makers. He has to deal with other market makers and get rid of the position okay because customers remember customers who are price takers therefore they are by def customers are price takers therefore by definition they are not price makers is this clear so you cannot go to a customer and ask him for a two-way price customers only do one they they come and either hit the bid or the offer and they deal on the market makers prices so if he wants a two-way price he has to go to another market maker this is clear okay so therefore he has to now go and sell it's also clear that he has to tell, sell 10 million so if he has to sell 10 million by dealing with another market maker at what price will he deal anybody else with a different view the question the question is we have already defined this GE market maker who's got 25 million worth of stock now net long and his risk management rule requires that if if he hits a net 25 percent 25 million position either net long or net short immediately has to bring it back down to 15 million net short or net long okay in this case his net long has hit 25 million so he has to bring the net long down to 15 million okay so therefore he has to sell immediately sell 10 million now he can only get a two-way price let's say from market other market maker he has to deal with other market makers okay so now he has to go to another market maker and deal on that on his prices and he has to sell 10 million so at what price will he sell it so parul is saying 75 73 clear it's 73 because now when the market maker goes and deals with another market maker he is now going to behave like he is going to be treated like a customer or a price taker okay so he has to ask another market maker for a price in this case the other market maker will quote him this price 73 75 so he'll have to deal on 73 because he's looking to sell okay so he's looking to sell so he'll have to sell at 73 okay but if he's able to sell and clear that transaction then he's got his position down by 10 so he is now within his limits 25 has gone down to plus 15 only clear <coughs> is everyone following so far yes sir okay 
so now therefore what we what I'm trying to say here is the entire discussion is you understand a little bit about how the market making business works and you also understand a little bit now about risk limits on any trading desk or any market making this is also going to be considered a trading desk on any trading desk there are going to be market uh, there are going to be risk limits okay because obviously you don't want to take too much risk because suppose imagine as I told you I mean if you have a situation like this that the guy is long 75 million shares and assume these are shares of GE the price of GE and then suddenly the market collapses so he will suffer a huge loss okay which is what happened on the you heard of the famous 1987 stock market crash in the US <coughs> you haven't heard of it you should have heard of it okay 1987 stock market crash okay so although today on the charts when you look at long-term charts you can barely see it <coughs> but essentially one of the things that happened was because everybody was dumping there was a market panic so everyone was dumping stock all right and the market makers were all getting very net long because everyone was dumping stock on them and the market price kept collapsing so eventually what happened is some of these many of these guys they stopped quoting prices they basically said which they are not supposed to have done because that was their obligation to quote prices okay so I think they didn't really face enough disciplinary action they should have been severely disciplined because uh, they, sh they failed to continue to quote prices so this is one of the things that happens in a market panic when the market is panicking okay and there's a sharp one-way movement and the market is panicking you'll suddenly find but this happens a lot uh, more in the OTC markets than in the exchange traded market but this was the case of an exchange traded market the New York Stock Exchange where market makers refused to fulfill their duties and quote two-way prices they basically stopped quoting because they had such massive long positions because everybody was selling to them and the market was collapsing and they were sitting on massive losses right so they basically said okay I'm not going to quote prices anymore okay because I can't afford to take any more losses which they strictly speaking they did not have the right to do that but any, that's what happened so this is what happens in a market panic so the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that because a market maker is not guaranteed to have a perfectly matched book at all times you can't expect that every instant some guy is coming and selling you X amount on the bid and some guy the, at the same instant some guy is coming and buying Y amount on the offer from you this is an ideal situation it's not going to happen in real in the real world right so you will have some kind of mismatch, mismatch. either you will be net long or net short <clears throat> and in that case since you don't know which way the market might go basically these guys the market making business in the market making business you really don't want the market to move around too much because if you get a very big movement either way you could lose a lot of money depending on how we are positioned okay so that's why I'm saying that these guys are the opposite of directional speculators they don't want a big directional move what ideally what market makers want which you see very often happening in a lot of the foreign exchange markets which are very liquid and they're not that volatile not as volatile as the equity markets okay what they really want is something like you know this kind of movement where you see here if you just focus on this part okay where the market is dropping then rising dropping and assuming that these moves are not very big they are still quite big actually but okay so ideally what a market maker wants is in a narrow price range assuming you collapse this range even more what they ideally want is the price to fluctuate in a narrow range and they want high volumes okay so think about how a market maker makes money if you look at the ideal situation for a market maker what is the ideal situation 50 percent uh, trades on the bid 50 percent trades on the offer and ideally very high volume okay uh, uh, approximately even distribution 50% of the trades on the bid 50% of the trades on the offer very high volume and not much market movement and let's take the extreme case of zero market movement to understand the uh, dynamics of the market making business let's take an idealized situation where we have zero market movement we have zero market movement very high volume okay and if perfectly distributed uh, perfectly evenly distributed uh, sells and buys so <clears throat> let's say you have very high volume say it's a 10 billion dollars worth of volume in a given day a market maker has done a total of 10 billion dollars worth of sales 5 billion has have been sold to him 5 billion of the base asset was sold to him and 5 billion of the base asset was bought from him 
Okay, we are taking an idealized situation. It will never happen like this. But to understand the dynamics of the market making business, what is the ideal situation for a market maker? We are taking an ideal scenario. Okay, so you have a very high volume day, $10 billion worth of business. You have perfectly evenly distributed uh, sales and buys. So $5 billion were sales to him and $5 billion were buys from him. Okay, so 5 billion of volume was taken uh, uh, of the base asset, 5 billion was given to him, so perfectly matched. Okay, and zero movement in the price. Okay, zero movement in the price. So, essentially, what this guy has made is if you assume this price is 73 and 75, so basically, he has captured two dollars. We are ignoring the 40 cents, so he has captured two dollars. Okay, on five billion dollars worth of transactions essentially okay buys and sells he has got five, essentially two dollars on five billion dollars this is clear to everyone okay so this is a very good day for any market maker so this is the ideal situation right? what the market maker wants is not much movement in the price tight range price should be in a tight range and there should be even distribution among the uh, across the bid and offer okay and then basically yeah so perfectly evenly distributed sales and buys and very high volume and not much movement in the price this is the ideal situation for a market maker here he will make maximum money if the price starts moving too sharply up and down he could get caught on the wrong side okay so generally market makers don't like that kind of a situation okay so although sometimes you could make money on that as well but essentially you are becoming like a directional speculator ideally a market maker should be uh, should not be betting on big directional movement he should really be trying to make money on the bid offer spread okay so this thing is called the bid offer spread we have it written down somewhere here very common logic okay so this is called the bid offer spread okay the gap between the bid and offer prices okay is the bid offer spread so in this case we would say in the case of Amazon we would say the bid offer spread is what is it? 2.4. Okay, so two dollars and forty cents. This is a bit of a spread. Okay, so is everyone clear so far? Okay, now you understand why I said that market makers are not directional speculators. You see that the ideal environment for them is just the opposite of the directional speculator. Okay, so if I'm betting here that the euro is going to rise, okay, if I go along as a directional speculator, as an asset manager managing a currency fund, if I go along here. What I really want is a big move. It's now 112.40. I want a big move above breaking above 114. You know, continuing this uptrend here, breaking above 114, heading up to 15, 16, etc. Okay, that's what I'm looking for—a big directional move in the uh, underlying asset, in the base asset. Is this clear? That's why I'm a directional speculator, like an asset manager. But if I'm a market maker, I don't want these big moves. I want the price to be as tightly uh, ranged as possible, in a, as pos as tight a range as possible. Not much movement in the price, massive volumes transacted, and kind of even distribution between my bids and offers. Okay, so is this clear? That's why I'm not a directional speculator as a market maker. I want the market to be very quiet. I don't want big directional movement. Okay, so you understand now a little bit about the dynamics of the market making business as well. Okay, that you should not really be taking in the ideal sense. You should not be taking big directional risks. Okay, so now this is. Um, so we just going to discuss a little bit about the bid offer spread. So now you understand why uh, this classification as well. Now uh, we'll just quickly recap before we go into the details of the bid offer spread. Just make sure we quickly recap the different categories of players in the market. We're losing the connection. Okay. So arbitrageurs, hedgers, and speculators. Speculators, we have divided into directional speculators and market makers. Now everyone is clear about why we have this kind of uh, nomenclature, okay? And very clearly defined, as you can see, because the definitions are such that you should not memorize them. You should be able to logically remember them based on what is their approach to risk. In that way, you can define all the categories, right? And here, directional speculators, whether you want or you don't want directional movement in the price, based on that, you have these two categories. Let's see this data is also not um,
all right we'll continue in the meantime with all right so now we go down to Benton offers okay so the bid offer spread we'll just wait for this thing to start responding so the bid, bid offer spread now we're going to continue with, with, with the bid offer spread we need to cover as much material as possible now what can we learn from the bid offer spread now you saw certain bid offer spreads you have already noticed we need this to come back but you would have already noticed that uh, in when I was showing you the euro and the dollar yen prices you would already notice that the bid offer spread in the euro and dollar yen is very tight you notice that like in the euro as well you have to go to the fifth decimal to see a difference otherwise it's all the same okay so this is actually one of the ways we measure you understand what is meant by liquidity which stocks are uh, likely to be more liquid the ones in the nifty 50 or the ones not in the nifty 50 are they just saying that the ones which are not in the nifty 50 are likely to be more liquid that's what you said you're wrong okay so you're saying the ones in the nifty 50 are likely to be more liquid so what do you understand by liquidity yeah so you're giving the classical corporate finance uh, definition which is good that you remembered that liquid assets are those which can be readily converted into cash okay so in a way that has the same meaning in the in the financial markets context as well so liquidity is essentially a market that is very liquid is is one where you can easily sell or buy okay you can uh, do uh, a lot you can trade in large volumes trade includes buy and sell okay so you can trade in large volumes without uh, significantly impacting the price because the price will always get impacted by uh, any transaction because if you are trying to buy that means you are creating excess demand or excess supply if you are trying to buy you are creating excess demand so normally ceteris paribus you remember the expression from economics ceteris paribus yeah other things remaining the same right so ceteris paribus if there is excess demand what will happen to the price the price will go up right so now the question is how much will the price go up okay that economics doesn't tell you because you can't really figure that out actually there's no real way to know that but the point is essentially that we define a liquid market as one in which you can transact in large volumes without significantly affecting the price so even if you create a uh, very significant excess demand the price will not move up that much because there's enough supply on the other side okay so there's a market is deep enough to absorb that uh, do you think this chrome is uh, freezing up because of the lack of the internet connection yes. chrome does that well, because maybe they are trying to uh, con constantly sell uh, constantly send your you know that google there somebody did some research on google and found that even when your phone is not connected to the internet they are collecting all your data yes. like you go from here to the atm they log that and later on when your connection comes back they send that information that why your phone will off <laughs> you didn't have the internet you went from here to the atm and they know that they did some research and found that they, they track all your movement okay maybe that's why okay what happened this connection is limited why is this connection limited Okay, let's try and continue whatever we can do without uh, it's connected now hopefully the data will come back this should not be uh, no internet access I don't know why this is showing no internet access very strange I have 2 GB of data per day and I'm not even used it and it's I, this is like my backup actually <laughs> so but i don't know why this sometimes this gives this kind of message i don't know whether it's the computer's wi-fi problem or okay let me try and do this again i don't know what the problem is whether it's a device problem or a computer wi-fi problem <laughs> Yeah, 
Yes. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned this once that because of the environment in the room. Okay. So don't say climatic conditions. You have to say environment in the room. Okay, now I understand. So it's nothing, neither my PC nor this, it's actually just the environment. What could they have done? I don't know why this problem is coming because in the first few years when I joined DSB, we never had this problem. I don't know what the problem. Okay, guys, we have to just manage then. In this case, we just have to manage. So you have to pay more closer attention. We won't have internet access uh, and we'll have to just see you know, what these guys are doing actually with this network. Oh, it's limited. What could they have done to jam the signal like this? Anyway, okay, so let's continue now. I mean, we have to just, we can't waste time waiting for this thing to come back. So we'll just have to, uh, you know, uh, continue this way. So the bids and offers, so the bid offers, the one of the ways in which you, so first we understand the concept of liquidity. Liquidity, a highly liquid market means that you can transact in very large volumes, okay, without significantly affecting the price. That means you can go and buy massive amounts of base, of the base asset, and the price won't move up much okay we'll just have to give up on this okay so the price won't move up much even if you uh, even if you um, transact in massive volumes of the massive amounts of the base asset the price won't move up much all right so uh, that's the so the, that's the meaning of a liquid market and one of the ways in which we assess the liquidity of a market is by looking at the bid offer spread so in a in a highly liquid market what is hap likely to happen to the bid offer spread is it likely to be narrower or wider narrower, narrower okay so the the uh, size of the bid offer spread is an indication of how liquid the market is okay so obviously you have to you have to adjust it when you're looking at uh, different kinds of prices like different prices have different levels right like for instance certain certain markets have very low prices like maybe intel stock is worth 14 dollars okay so if you're looking at looking at a spread on 14 dollars okay versus certain types of assets like gold might be worth 14 uh, 1500 dollars so when you're looking at a spread on a 1500 dollar uh, price okay you can't look compare it directly in absolute terms to a 14 dollar price you have to equalize it to the same dollar amount okay and look at the percentage difference in the bid offer but the point is that the in general the uh, size of the bid offer spread indicates the liquidity of the market okay so we've got this back hopefully our our software also has come back great so now you can see here's an example of how how liquid the market is okay uh, so you can see how liquid the foreign exchange markets are we our data is live okay you can see look at the dollar uh, look at the two examples here euro and uh, dollar yen why is the dollar yen price not showing maybe because of the lack of data okay so you can see how tight the euro prices are in the fifth decimal you can that's where you can see the difference okay this is how tight the euro des, uh, euro uh, the euro prices are okay this is a, the euro is the most liquid of the foreign exchange markets then you have the dollar yen and you can see how dollar yen is also very tight can you see that you can't see any you have to go to the third decimal to see the uh, difference okay up to the second decimal is the same so these are the two most liquid uh, uh, dollar uh, foreign exchange markets and even cable this gbp usd in the spot market is referred to as cable i already told you the story here also you can see that it's very tight okay uh, but this is not as liquid as the euro yes uh, euro dollar fx and the dollar yen okay so so you can see that the uh, the liquid markets have a very tight uh, bid offer spread and let's just go down a little bit more to see we have already um, all right so essentially here are big words but essentially what we are saying is the spread in any given market is not going to be the same all through the day the spread will keep changing and it will reflect the level of liquidity in the market okay so when you have uh, uh, essentially a higher bid offer spread implies a less liquid market okay so understand how the lower bid offer spread uh, essentially results from competition among market makers remember all market makers are trying to generate business okay so if some market maker sees the price 
maybe he looks at we'll take uh, different prices and we'll assume that they are actually the same so if somebody let's look at apple okay obviously the market is closed so the white spread is quite wide but let's look at apple and see okay some market maker sees that the apple prices are actually 204 26 we'll just say 2062 so the market maker sees 2062 and he says okay this spread is very wide let me uh, people don't have interest to transact in the market if the spread is so wide let me just quote a tighter spread so he might quote say 30 40. so if he quotes 30 40 means he's willing to buy at 30 and sell at 40. so now he has narrowed the spread okay so i'm giving an extreme example but this is how the spread comes down so in a liquid market essentially what happens is uh, that you have more market makers typically in a liquid market okay and typically liquid markets tend to be less regulated which is why you see here the connection between i every chance i get i uh, you know unleash on the indian regulators for over regulating indian markets okay you see the connection to that now that essentially what happens one of the things that happens when you over regulate the market and you don't allow players to come in like the classic example is the indian bond market if you look, look at the indian corporate debt market and the uh, government debt market also we have all kinds of limits on what fii's can invest in right you can invest in so much and the way we manage it that when we feel more confident okay from 15 percent we raise it to 18 percent then we raise it to 25 percent so this is kind of micromanaging okay but essentially what happens is uh, and we put all kinds of restrictions on how they can hedge and not hedge their foreign exchange exposures and all that okay so uh, by putting all these restrictions what you're essentially doing is you're not allowing uh, large volumes of foreign capital to come into the market and that is affecting the liquidity of the market so the liquidity uh, the debt markets in india are not as liquid as uh, they could be if we had allowed more people to come in and the fear is the general policy fear is that if we allow lots of people to come in then when there's some kind of market panic like this nbfc crisis that you had then a lot of capital will flow out okay so but then this is a problem which it's like you know this this you cannot ever get this is actually it's like failing to understand partly what they're doing is they are they are not able to appreciate the benefits of larger levels of part higher levels of participation and they have too much fear about what will happen when capital flows out because capital flows out means in the sense that it's not that every foreign investor has the same time horizon some people will have a in any market some people will have a short term horizon some people have a medium term horizon some people have a long term horizon if you open up the market to all the investors there will be some longer term investors so some people who are fleeing in a time of panic some people might see it, some other investors might see it that as an opportunity to come in so there are self correcting mechanisms so essentially these kinds of decisions happen because people don't understand the power of free markets to provide liquidity to add to bring prosperity and all that so essentially it comes from uh, a failure to appreciate the benefits of a free market so if you have like if you look at the us markets the us has a very big debt problem their debt is equal to almost 22 percent of gdp is, is 22 trillion which is about 100 percent of gdp almost slightly more than 100 percent of gdp the us debt the national debt is around 22 trillion now and their gdp is around 20 trillion so their debt is about more than 100 percent of gdp but you see actually if you look at us markets what is happening to the if you look at we're going into a policy discussion i hope you guys don't switch off when i have policy discussions are you uh, finding it uh, not interesting what because everybody kind of goes dead what what not interesting not interesting why why are policy discussions not interesting isn't policy everything at the end of the day policy is everything right policy affects you policy affects everybody okay what happened okay so the point i'm trying to make here is that the u.s debt is actually people have been uh, you know afraid of what the u.s debt will do to the u.s economy from the time i entered the market around 1989 from there on i've been hearing stories about how the u.s debt is going to 
destroy the US economy and that time the debt was much lower it was around I think it's around 5 trillion or something and now the debt is 22 trillion okay but now still look at how low the interest rates are okay so this is kind of the time when I entered the market and so it's going down continuously while the debt has been increasing continuously and you see how now even now the debt is quite the interest rates are quite low this is 2.06 percent is what the US Treasury is paying for borrowing for 10 years okay the US Treasury is paying 2.06 percent for 10 year borrowing on the international capital markets okay the US capital markets essentially because they have freely they have a freely convertible currency so one of my points is that you know when one of the things we don't realize in India is this is why is this the case why is the US government not paying a higher interest rate even though their debt is more than 100 percent of GDP one of the reasons for that is that the US market obviously it's a very big economy is the biggest and the most deepest capital markets in the world so any central bank anywhere which has a surplus what do they do with that surplus so some of that they buy gold like even our reserves if you look at RBI reserves what do they do and then the next option is invest in US treasuries because you when you invest in US treasuries it's a free market they don't put unlike us they don't put all as a caps who can invest how much who can take out how much money at what point of time whether you can hedge not hedge it, it's a free market you come in whatever you want to do come in buy sell go back okay so it's a free market so people feel comfortable that nobody's going to stop me if i want to need, if i need to pull the money out so that's why all the world's capital goes into the u.s capital markets and that is one of the reasons why the u.s government is able to borrow at so such low interest rates okay even though their debt is up more than 100 percent of gdp okay this is one of the reasons because and japan is another example japan's debt is even worse i think those guys are about 160 percent of gdp or something like that their national debt is more than 100 percent 160 percent of gdp but even japan has a freely convertible currency today anybody from india can go let's say idbi bank has excess reserves uh, you know they want to invest something in the i mean for the idbi bank is not a good example because rbi will prevent them from investing abroad freely but rbi if the rbi wants to if the RBI wants to invest in some of India's reserves in Japanese government bonds, they can freely go in and buy as much as they want. Okay. And they can then whenever they want to sell, they can freely sell and come out. Nobody's going to say anything to them. Okay. That's why. So the point is that if you close the door, okay, or you put all kinds of restrictions on people exiting, then obviously not many people are going to come in the first place. You follow the logic as an investor. If I think that I can't even go out when I want to or I have all kinds of restrictions then they will not come in in the first place so therefore the point is they should realize the benefits so these are some of the benefits when you have deep and liquid capital markets and that only happens from if you we are looking at the same uh, logic here you saw you saw how uh, this happened right that you have a lower bid offer spread is from competition among market makers okay so one guy sees the bid offer spread as being very wide 30 30 90 on apple he says this is too wide let me quote 40 60 so i can pick up the business okay if i quote 40 60 more people will come and deal with me okay so that's you understand the logic here okay he's quoting a tighter price better price okay both sides are better 30 40 is better than 30 as a bid and 60 is better than 90 as an offer okay so this is how you get competition and this is how you get a more liquid market and where will the competition among market makers come from if you have many market makers then there will be competition if you are restricting the number of investors so the moment you uh, restrict the number of investors you are automatically affecting the liquidity of the market so these are some of the things that our policy makers don't think about which is that by restricting the number of players because you have a fear that oh when these guys go out there will be volatility and all that <coughs> What you are doing is you are affecting the liquidity of the market and by affecting the liquidity you are affecting the transaction costs of people who are going to use the market think about come back and look at the foreign exchange market you see how tight the euro is okay how, how tight the spreads are who needs to buy euros all kinds of companies around the world Toyota Motor has to sell let's say Toyota Motor is selling out a large volume of cars into Europe eventually those proceeds have to be repatriated they need to sell those euros and buy yen okay so you can think of this as a two-leg transaction first they'll sell the euros and buy dollars then they'll sell the dollars and buy yen because ultimately Toyota wants yen so here's an example of a corporate customer who needs to use the foreign exchange markets okay so let's quickly test your concepts when Toyota Motor wants to 
go from euros to yen we're going to make it more complicated because actually although you have a direct market in euro yen <clears throat> i'm going to make it more complicated to test your concept so you are the treasurer of toyota motors and you have let's say five billion euros in your uh, quarterly sales revenue that you need to uh, send back to tokyo okay and you're sitting here in frankfurt and you need to trade in uh, you need to sell five billion euros and buy yen okay you can't trade directly in euro yen so we are just putting that restriction so what are you going to do now which price are you going to hit on the euro now we can't even say <laughs> which one the left or the right left okay because i'm a seller of euros so you need to understand in this market the euro dollar fx market what is the base asset okay so sorry um, I, I forgot at that point uh, let's finish this problem there. so euro dollar fx what is the base asset euro, euro. euro. some people are not sure shivam is not 100 percent sure what is the rule i told you this is a matter of convention so you can sort of memorize the rule that <coughs> the base asset is shown first in the foreign exchange markets where they show two assets the base asset is shown first okay so now you're clear shivam the base asset is shown first so euro usd means euro must be the base asset eventually you will get to know by just getting familiar so the euro is the base asset so this price bid and offer means that you are selling when toyota motor is selling uh in, in and these are the market makers prices they will have to sell on the market makers offer or bid bid they'll have to sell on the market makers bid so they have to sell on the price on the left because we can't even say 39 because both are 39 so we have to say four and five here okay so one and two okay you guys can still see one and two sg1 you can see that okay all right so first he sells at 39 one he sells the five billion euros okay he gets some amount of dollars okay how many dollars does he get how do we get what is the formula 5 billion into 1.12391 he gets that many dollars okay now he needs to it's not good enough for him to have dollars he needs yen so now what does he have to do buy dollars or sell dollars he has to sell dollars and buy yen so now he goes to the yen market makers uh, now sell dollar and buy yen at which price will he sell four or five ask price i'm selling dollars at five on the ask price okay who's saying ask price and who are saying some people there's a difference of opinion here okay let's first be clear about the concepts dollar yen which is the base asset in the dollar yen market what is the base asset dollar is the base asset okay and what am i trying to sell dollars i'm trying to sell the base asset so the bid i will sell either on the bid or on the offer now am i a price maker or a price taker as toyota i am a price some people are not clear about this also some people are saying maker taker right as in t for uh, trivandrum t right anybody everybody in t or m for madras anybody t for trivandrum okay okay so i am a price taker is everyone clear anjum you're clear sukriti okay okay so i'm a price taker now what am i trying to do as a price taker i'm trying to sell the base asset so i have to deal at the price at which the market maker is willing to buy or sell the base asset if i'm selling the base asset in the transaction what is the market maker doing he is buying the base asset if i'm selling the base asset that means he has to be buying the base asset so at what price is he buying the base asset at the bid is everyone clear yes sir. have you followed the logic yes please make sure you go and revise all this stuff okay because if you don't revise it you won't be able to internalize it you're still making some mistakes which is natural because you're encountering these problem concepts for the first time so it's not that they're very complicated okay but uh, it's just that it's uh, technical and you have to be careful you just have to be careful that's what matters so once you revise it a few times on your own then you can actually make sure you replay the video go through the same questions and make sure you can understand and answer the questions and then everything should become so once the concept is clear then everything will be clear to you okay so uh, therefore now toyota will sell at the bid price yes or no yes. bid price so at 74.5 they'll sell the dollars the dollars that they got from the euro dollar fx transaction okay is this clear yes sir okay so they'll sell it here now they'll have some amount of yen how much yen 
whatever dollar amount they had into 107.747 that's the amount of yen okay and then they'll they'll uh, that that yen will be sent to their account in tokyo is this clear yes, sir. is everyone clear now about this okay so now here's an example now what happens is now we are making a connection between the corporate use of the market so the toyota uh, toyota motor in this case is called an end user we would classify toyota motor as an end user of the fx market because they are actually not in the business of they are not a, a foreign exchange market maker right toyota motor is not a foreign exchange market maker but in the course of doing their business running their own operations of selling cars they eventually have foreign exchange exposures this is the foreign exchange exposure for them because they have five billion dollars worth of sales uh, sorry five billion euros worth of sales in europe and that's no good for them because their earnings are in yen their statements are in yen so they need to send those uh, euros back to japan in the form of yen so they have a yen they have they are actually long essentially here we would say because they need to buy yen and they have euros which they want to sell so we say here that they are long yen and they're long euros and short yen okay they're long euros and short yen so essentially have a, they have a foreign exchange position so as a result of their normal operations of making and selling cars they have ended up in with foreign exchange exposure they did not ask for it okay but uh, because toyota would have been just as successful if the whole world had only one currency right if the whole world had one currency they would have we presume they would have been just as successful right because they are not they are not connected to the idea of multiple currencies but because the world does not have one currency now they ended up they have ended up with currency exposures as a result of doing their business okay so this is what we call a example of a passive risk book which we will study later but you can get this idea that corporates end up with foreign exchange exposures even though they don't really want them they don't necessarily want them but they end up have these exposures so one of the things you can see that because the spreads are so tight now sometimes what might happen is a big company like toyota might have other side exposures but sometimes they might need to buy euros and everything may not be perfectly matched the time when they had to sell excess euros to sell at that time they may not know that they have a requirement to buy euros also but suddenly something might happen after two months they might have to buy euros okay some operational requirement they might have to buy euros okay so in this case when you have a big company with complex operations you might have suddenly another foreign exchange need right so again then in this case now they have to go and deal on the opposite side right they will have to now buy therefore they will be buying euros on the market makers offer etc right so the point i'm trying to make here is that when you have tighter bid offer spreads you have a more liquid market with tighter bid offer spreads that is more beneficial to end users of the market because their transaction cost so you this is an economic concept of transaction costs okay transaction cost is not difficult to understand you can even think of it in in in, in more uh, everyday terms if you have to go to a new house let's say you get posted to bombay you have to search for a new house how much are you going to search you may not find the right perfect place but after searching for six or seven after seeing 15 20 houses at some point you're going to say i just can't take it anymore i'll just take something which is acceptable right that's what you do so essentially what you're doing is you're saying that you can't handle the transaction costs anymore because technically you can keep on looking for a house until you find the perfect house you keep on looking for 60 houses 70 houses at some point you decide that the transaction cost of looking for the perfect house is too high i just want to close it and finish it out right now okay so that's an example of a trend of transaction cost as well in an economic sense but here you have a clearer example of transaction cost where toyota has to buy and sell euros both but they are on both sides of the transaction very often so if the market bid offer spreads are tighter they get more bang for their buck do you see that that from toyota's point of view as a as an end user of the market having tighter bid offer spreads is beneficial for them directly they make more money do you see that because in this case instead of selling dollars at 73 if they have to sell at 70 then they would get less yen yes. If they're going to sell at 70, they would get less yen. So the tighter the bid offer spread, the better it is for the end users because their transaction costs are lower. So if Toyota had to sell instead of 73, they had to sell at 70, we would say that their transaction costs are higher. This is clear. The concept we have now brought in another concept of transaction cost. Okay. So transaction cost, a simple way to measure transaction cost is to just dollarize the bid offer spread if you want to compare. 
okay in this case we'll just keep it one level simpler and we'll just say we look at the absolute level of the bid offer spread and you can see that um, the wider the bid offer spread the higher the transaction cost is this concept clear to everybody yes sir. right so this essentially so this is another reason and once again we can correct it uh, with apologies to Tarun we can once again connect it to the policy question that when you have liquidity when you have uh, see this is what happens when you restrict the number of players are you able to see the connection between market liquidity and the number of players in the market the more players you have if you open the door to everybody in the world more and more people will come in and kind of on an average over the long term some people will be sellers some will be buyers some will be long term some will be short term not everybody has the same horizon okay so there will be an even distribution more or less over the long term okay but the more the players the more liquid the market okay the more the players the more liquid the market and the more liquid the market the tighter the transaction cost the tighter the bid offer spread are you following the more liquid the market higher more players translates to more liquidity more liquidity translates to tighter bid offer spreads are you following the logic yes. okay and then tighter bid offer spreads translates directly to benefits to end users like corporate customers okay so in India if I was taking the guy I was giving you the example of the bond market one of the problems we have in the bond market the reason you have all this big NBFC crisis and all these problems with the public sector banks one of the reasons is the indian corporate sector is over reliant on bank sector on the bank on bank finance okay if you look at developed economies like the us they use we'll study this later when we study capital markets but in the developed economies uh, financing comes much more from capital markets and less from the traditional banking sector and here's an example india is an example now unfortunately uh, of, as an example our, our financial sector development hasn't kept pace with the real economy that we are actually underdeveloped so there's more reliance on bank finance and that's why because the banks are financing everybody they're not diversifying their risk they're not able to diversify the risk so all these nbfc problems everything Thing comes up to the banks eventually all the problems can eventually come into the public sector banks okay so therefore if we had a more developed can what is what had hindered what has hindered the development of the capital markets over regulation trying to restrict the players who can come in so if we had more players more open uh, markets more players more liquidity tighter bid offer spreads corporates could have borrowed at a lower cost in the capital markets in our debt markets are a disaster basically they are literally non-existent okay so uh, you'll see another bias here basically because of uh, debt markets are typically OTC markets and we have a very anti OTC market bias in our regulation and that's why debt markets are not so the net result of underdeveloped debt markets is corporate sector is not able to borrow at lower costs are you following yes, sir. and you see how it has a direct connection to the competitiveness of the economy if your debt funding is at a higher cost your total cost of capital will be higher or lower higher, higher. And if your cost of capital is higher, is it going to be a competitive advantage or a disadvantage? <laughs> disadvantage. That's one of the reasons why you see everywhere in the world American companies are dominating. Why? Because their cost of capital is lower. Because they have more developed capital markets. Capital market funding typically is cheaper than bank funding. Okay. This is one of the reasons. There are many other reasons why they're dominant. Okay. Because they have free markets, less regulation overall. So but this is one of the factors so these things our policymakers have never thought about these things their only thing is oh my god too many players volatility they'll run away with their capital and there'll be ups and downs in prices but the point is by focusing on this one fear they have lost out on they haven't they don't have a vision of what they have lost out on okay by not having these uh, benefits from free markets anyway so we still have uh, two and a half minutes we can make good use of our time okay so uh, is this clear now how competition among market makers reduces uh, bid offer spreads? Yes, sir. Okay, good. That's a very tired yes, sir. I mean, <laughs> you are dying for the market to end. Okay, one more comment. Uh, so, for the class to end. Okay, read this part in yellow. I don't know if you can read it. I'm just going to reduce it and make it. Now you can read it. Okay. So the point I'm trying to illustrate is all this funny stuff that you can't read it now. Shreya, what happened? Is this? Uh, can you read it? Okay. Let me just make. Now you can read. 
okay so the point is i'm just trying to illustrate you might wonder about this funny stuff here well let's just close it today with a discussion of pipettes okay these um i'll put these two links also in your uh, notes in the in the notes that you have access to so essentially pipettes is what we are saying is just the idea of uh, price improvement by adding decimals to quotes okay these are called pipettes in fx code fifth decimal in dollar swiss or third decimal in dollar yen so what i'm trying to illustrate here is just this okay please pay attention guys please pay attention last few minutes uh, just an example of how competition among market makers has uh, led to you know adding to the decimals and tightening the spread do you agree that seven let's say we can't even take this because these are so tight okay so let's say i have 3580 okay so if i have 3580 on apple okay let's just focus on apple i have 3580 on apple now if i as a new market maker i want to make make my price more attractive so if i quote 35 half 75 half is it a tighter spread instead of 3580 I quote 35 no I'm trying to show you the decimal place adding the decimal place now I'm going to quote 35 half so 20.35 cents and half a cent 35 half I'm only quoting the cents here okay so this is 35 80 cents 35 cents 80 cents right now is this clear so I want to make it I want to give a more competitive quote I'm a new market maker I want to make my name in the market I want more business so instead of quote i see that the market is 3580 what do i do i quote 35 half 75 half so i quote 35 0.355 is this a tighter spread yes sir. it's a tighter spread right so you can see how by adding a decimal point i can improve my uh, the competitiveness of my quote is that clear yes okay so what you see here the reason you see these fx quotes these are superscripts. Can you see that 74.4, 74.5? Now, in FX earlier, dollar yen was only quoted to two spread, two decimals. Euro was only quoted to four decimals. Okay, but because the market is so uh, active and so many players, it's so competitive. Now the market has moved to fifth decimal quoting because people are trying to distinguish themselves by quoting tighter and tighter prices, trying to gain volume. Are you following the logic? The same logic that you are adding a decimal place making your prices even more competitive but ideally this can happen in a market now if in our market the regulator will come in and say no you can't quote to five decimals yes. okay well that's what they do first thing they say is no okay so you can't quote to five then what you're doing immediately you're stopping the market from innovating and creating benefits for customers is this better for customers or not Yes, yes. Fifth, third decimal quoting in dollar yen better for customers yes, yes. right yeah Kartik is very concerned that the time has been crossed but I'm just trying to illustrate a point is this clear yes so another point I've shown you now is how adding decimal points to adding decimal points to uh, price quotations is basically happening because market makers are competing with each other and trying to gain business this is what competition does competition lowers costs okay and that benefits the end users yes. this idea should be clear in your head right okay i'm going to deduct two marks for karthik and uh, and uh, yash for too much activity no you guys were talking between yourselves no no, no, no i saw no no i saw you guys you were talking between yourselves and you got up also you got up before the class was over okay class is dismissed one minute one minute one minute no you don't have to talk you don't have to talk you just have to be engaged in activity which is no, not active in all the plus of even I no 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 speak a single word no 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 you have to be you have to be focused on what is being discussed in the class any kind of defocusing doing no, your own thing you haven't speak a single word so why are you you don't have to speak you don't have to speak you don't have to speak you have to be just engaged in activity which is other than what you are supposed to be doing which is focusing on the class okay class is dismissed anybody any questions technical questions you can come here then i won't close the video one minute one minute one minute one minute one minute i'm not going to